I'm glad to introduce Fred Brewster to give the first talk this session. Um, you can see that he's from down under, like a few, <laughs> one or two others of us. <laughs> so, Fred, you're a good guy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please take it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Michael, um, for the introduction. So I don't have to worry about uh, people Googling right now where the University of Queensland is. We know it's in Australia. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk. My, the essence of my talk would be a little bit maybe different than all the previous talks in that I'm interested in randomness and ra uh, randomized approach, but not necessarily to see how I can solve a problem more efficiently, but rather um, as it relates to me being able to understand why uh, a method does what it does or why a model works. So more in the sense of understanding as opposed to um, efficient solution. So, you know, it's a program on data science uh, and uh, if you ask uh, anyone what is, uh, what is data science, you probably hear tons of different um, definitions. It's really not sure, uh, no one knows what the data science is, but you know, you can see a lot of buzzwords coming around and everybody looks at data science from their own perspective, right? Some look at it as a way that I got a big data set, I want to work with it. The other one is that where the data is coming from, they interpret the results and so on and so forth. But regardless of uh, where you're coming from, uh, hopefully everybody agrees that uh, data science, whatever it is, lies somewhere in the intersection of uh, computer science, domain uh, scientists, to whatever uh, it is that they do, and the math or, or statistics. And uh, traditionally, um, maybe the problems were initiated by the people in the domain because they had the data, but they didn't know how to analyze it, and probably they tried to approach computer scientists because they had the algorithms, um, statisticians and mathematicians had the models, and then uh, mathematicians and computer scientists worked together to, to try to solve these more uh, um, efficiently. Now, I was uh, aware of you know, the existence of uh, the domain scientist, if you will, and I was uh, educated personally as a computer scientist, so I really underappreciate, maybe I didn't appreciate enough the role of the statistics um, uh, in, in understanding data scientific questions. And uh, a couple of recent results have developed a special appreciation for, for the role of randomization, this randomized analysis and statistics in answering data science questions. And these are, are gonna be the examples that I'm gonna share with you uh, from my perspective, uh, how, I, um, how I approach these things. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, so you analyze data, you often are given some kind of a model, either it's explicitly given to you or by making some assumptions or the typical type of algorithms you're using, you implicitly make some assumptions about the models or you work with models implicitly. And um, the talks that we've been hearing and most often uh, probably, uh, most uh, probably the, the rest of the um, workshop as well, will mostly be focused on randomized methods that how you efficiently solve or compute with these models. Um, but the interest of this particular talk and maybe some other ones as well is that uh, to use randomized ideas to understand why these models work or why they don't. And uh, I will do this, uh, hopefully try to get to uh, two sets of examples. One is the application of randomized analysis in understanding certain aspects of deep learning and the, the other one would be the same, but in, in the context of uh, graph analysis. And the first paper is uh, uh, entirely the work of my PhD student, Grosso. Uh, all the credit goes to him, and all the criticism goes to me, uh, or Marcus, more me. Uh, but uh, this is the first one about the deep learning. And the second one, I hope I get a chance to talk about it. As you can see, I didn't put it up here because I didn't want you to freak out and see tons of these circles up there. And uh, if I get to it, I'll try to talk about it. If not, uh, no big deal. I just wanted to say a shout out to, uh, to the people who actually made this also work happen. This is the graph. Keith was here a couple of days ago. He gave a talk on this uh, in a reading group. So hopefully uh, some of you have seen this. If I get, don't get to it, that will be okay. All right, so deep learning. 
regardless of you know how you interpret deep learning or neural net and so on some people want to turn it a little bit sexier than it is and say you know it's come from the brain it's trying to model the neurons in the brain and so on and so forth and some mathematicians also make it probably a little bit more simpler than what it should be and say oh it's just you know composition of a bunch of nonlinear functions and it's nothing else and um, well I, I agree with the second uh, second perspective where yeah in order as a mathematical object is just nothing but a composition of a nonlinear composition of functions where you put a uh, I hope I'm not blocking uh, the view, but uh, where you put in a signal into the network, you sort of uh, weight it by a certain weight matrix, you put it through a nonlinearity, you do it repeatedly a certain number of times, and then you end up having an output. And you can do these, you know, there's no reason why there's three here, there could be, you know, 30 or 300 and so on. And deep refers to these three approaching 300 and 3000. And this is the revolution. Some people refer to it as a deep learning revolution because uh, if you look at the progress in, in machine learning in terms of the accuracy of the uh, prediction, say, for example, classification error rate on this typical data set, <laughs> uh, canonical data set, ImageNet, you see that the winners across the years, progressively, the neural net that they used, they had one thing in common, and that's that the, the, the depth started going up and up and up and up. And the more depth they had, the better results at the end of it uh, they, they managed to, to get. And this became sort of like a game of, you know, let me just push the boundaries and have a deeper, you know, deeper, uh, um, a d deeper net uh, to the point where, you know, there's cartoons about it. That you know, uh, you know, this is just like you know, I was doing well until this guy added a couple more layers and a couple more GPUs, and managed to beat me on ImageNet. Now it's my turn to to do that again. And you can also see the correlation if you superimpose this on that, you'll see pretty much the same pattern <laughs> in terms of the number of registrations and paper submissions and NIPs. So depth, this is literally uh, most often is d depth related, right? Depth is, depth is driving the, the uh, popularity and the also success of machine learning to some degree. But, uh, you know, to, to the level that it's been uh, quotes that, you know, you can do anything almost. Uh, if not the best option to do it, it's going to be the second best option to do anything you want with neural net as long as it's deep enough. And uh, which is which is the reality. And uh, but you know, this is is it all rosy? I mean, so why don't we just keep tagging onto it? Uh, you know, three thousand layers and just solve everything we want. And it turned out that uh, beyond computational constraints, suppose you could throw all the GPUs in the world at it. Beyond computational constraints, there are other inherent issues with increasing depth. And I'm going to touch upon a few of these. Uh, some of them uh, you already have seen it many times, and they're actually uh, textbook stuff. And a couple of them are a little bit more new in terms of uh, what could wrong, go, go wrong when I have a deep model. So I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, vanishing and exploding gradient problem. This was a classical problem that was uh, observed a few decades ago, a few years ago, I'm not sure exactly when, but at the outset of, you know, people trying to get layers and tag on layers, the, the immediate problem was the vanishing or exploding gradient problem. If you have seen this before, I apologize that I have to repeat, but if not, essentially the idea is this. So I have, say here, three, two hidden layers, one input layer and one output layer. It's a simple network. And for simplicity, I also assume that my loss function is just a quadratic. So I put an x here. I get a prediction of what y should be. That's why it's y hat. And I have some labels or some whatever it is. And I compare it as it relates to L2 norm, right? If I want to compute, if I want to find the optimal weight that minimizes this objective, I have to run some kind of a gradient-based algorithm. So I have to be able to compute the gradient of this cost function with respect to every one of these W's. And these W's, the, the, without this uh, subscript, essentially is all these W's tagged on uh, in a long vector matrix, doesn't matter really. Okay, so let's look at what is the gradient of the cost function with respect to the weight at, at say, layer L, 
that takes in the ice neuron of the previous layer to Jace neuron of the next layer, right? So there's all these connections and I'm trying to compute the, uh, the gradient in the output with respect to the input. <coughs> all right, it turns out to be, you know, if you go through this backward pro back propagation uh, algorithm and so on, it comes out to be the product of two terms, doesn't matter what they are. The important thing is that, that one of these terms depends on the derivative of, of these sigmas here. They're known as activation function. The derivative of the activation function at certain point. Now, if your activation function has a lot of flat regions, then this is going to be very small, if not zero. And you see that in order to compute this, I also need to compute other quantities from the layers uh, after this layer, which all of these also include terms like that. Yes? You are, you are addressing a specific algorithm here. Yes. But there is a much more general statement. I am. This three layer neural network is already yes. empty hard. Why to, are you not just that in physics? Yes, it's. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, quite, I didn't quite understand the objection, but I will. Um, if, if there was an objection or a <laughs> question. Why analyze a specific algorithm? I'm it's known that it's MP hard to approximate no yes. matter what algorithm. Yeah, I am trying to sort of motivate the, the problems that could arise with depth if you do things naively without any uh, bells and whistles. So I get to it. <coughs> so the, 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 what happens is that at the end of the day, what you can get, you can get a very small component here, and you end up getting a gradient that has some of the components of it is gone to zero, if not zero. And so it, it's very hard to to do and run any optimization algorithms, as you can imagine, if the layers are long, this problem could be aggravated. This is an algebraic point of view for this, for this problem. But uh, as a scientific computing, uh, if you look at this, you can also look at it from a geometrical point of view. This could be very well wrong, but it's my intuition at what this could happen geometrically. And that is, you're probably dealing with a problem that's very, very ill-conditioned. So it, in essence, when you're computing the gradient, you have a whole lot of Jacobians that multiply each other. And at the end, some directions get magnified and some directions get smaller. And that's why your gradient loses component in a certain direction and gains components significantly larger in another direction. So you can look at it from the geometric and algebraic point of view. But you know, people have, have realized this, uh, as it was pointed out, and there are so many other ways that you can get around this, this particular issue. By changing your activation function, instead of using the typical thing that people used to do, like the tan H or, or the um, sigmoid, and now there are people who work with the, with the real U, get, gets around this issue of vanishing gradient. You can also try to come up with careful initialization. These, you can fine tune the step size, batch normalization, and also more recently the, uh, the new architectures like ResNet and uh, the highway networks that get around us. But the common denominator on, uh, in all of these remedies pretty much is that the, you look at the problem, it manifests some algebraic or geometric issues, and you try to mitigate those. And the topic, the, the, so all of this was uh, motivation. I wasn't trying to say whether it's the right way to do it or wrong. It's just that, you know, things like that can happen. So, but uh, okay, so you look at it as a geometric algebraic point of view, you come up with the solution. But the point is, are these all the, uh, there is to it? Are there other viewpoints that we can take to study the similar problem? And the, the thing that wasn't known to me but became known to me very recently is that yes, you can look at these issues in a randomized or a statistical point of view, and as a result, you can actually have some, bet, some more insight into what can go wrong. And, and uh, to the best of my, no, no, uh, my knowledge, this was first uh, very recently pointed out by these guys. I think the paper was published at ICML that they said that, you know, forget about the vanishing exploding gradient problem and so on. There's another issue with the depth. And that is once you get a deeper net, your gradient actually behaves like white noise, which is a statistical statement. There is no longer any, you know, algebraic or geometrical notion to it. And, uh, but there's a caveat in here where the, uh, the gradient is with respect to the inputs. So, you know, you can argue what that even means. But in the paper, they say, because of these chain rules and so on, you can relate this to also the actual gradient training 
where, where in, in a one layer feed forward network, the, the gradient of the output with respect to the input actually has some sort of a structure. But as you increase the layers to 24, you see that you, what you end up getting is pretty much white noise. Whereas the ResNet maintain this the structure and the, 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 the effect of the losing the correlation it actually appears much less. And they also have very interesting theory in which they show that uh, this is indeed true, that the correlation between the gradient actually geometrically goes to zero for the feed forward networks. And for the ResNet, actually, it's going to get better. And if you do batch normalization, you actually circumvent this problem altogether. So just looking at the problem in a randomized way, you all of a sudden came up with a new problem that didn't exist before. And this, is, this was very interesting to me. And as a result, we sort of started to look at it in that direction. So we already knew the algebraic geometric issues that can go wrong, exploding vanishing gradient problems, so on and so forth. The statistical randomized approach, those guys came up with the shattered gradient problem. And what we did um, was, uh, I'll leave you the, to guess the, the acronyms, but uh, this is the problem we came up with. Kernelized reduced angle problem. And we came up with this problem uh, in the spirit of giving everything sexy names these days. This is not sexy, but it's still like, yes. Before you tell me more about crap, I yeah. want to know more about shattered gradient. Yes. So you say that gradients were not correlated. What yes. gradients weren't correlated? So, so the gradient of the output with respect to the input. So here, the examples that, for example, is on the, on the slide is, is a network uh, consists of one input and one output. Right, just a scalar input, scalar output. And they compute the gradient and they range over all the possible inputs in, a, in an interval. And they, they plot the, uh, what the gradient the, in the output would be. So as you vary the input, yes. the yes, gradient. Yes, 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 yes. And you can think of this as sort of some kind of a sensitivity of the network with respect to the input, where uh, if I'm changing a little bit here in the input, uh, my, my network can, can sort of distinguish between the inputs because it, you know, it doesn't behave like complete wa white noise. It doesn't wash out the information in the input. So this is the correlation at the start of training? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's also another caveat, which is just assuming you know, a particular set of weights initialized randomly. Yes, exactly. I'll get to training at the very end if I get a chance. All right, so we get to crap with the K. And the goal of my talk is that the deep forward networks are, are crappy. And I'll go through this to explain what this means. We didn't put the terminology crap in the paper, obviously, because we weren't going to get accepted. But I think we should have, because that would give citations. Okay. So, <laughs> 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 so what, what, what does crap say? The crap says that as the depths increase, Something we, we call the kernelized angles between the inputs go to zero. And I spend a few lectures to describe what this graph, this graph means. Again, caveat is only at initialization, but we're going to relax it at the very end. All right. Let, let, let's just take a step back and look at the very simple case where the nonlinear activation functions are actually linear. Right? So I'm not doing anything sophisticated here. It's just that I put an input in the matrix. Uh, in, the, in the network, I multiply it by a bunch of matrices and I get a vector out. So there's no nonlinearity. This is very familiar to a lot of people who have done numerical linear algebra. In fact, we saw a couple of talks in the morning. This resembles what happens in power iteration or crawl of subspace methods, right? Very simplified version is that suppose you get two vectors, you start from two arbitrary vectors, no particular assumptions about this at this stage. If I repeatedly apply a matrix A to that matrix, to, the, to each one of these in, uh, separately, and I keep repeating it over and over and over again, forget about the normalization and so on and so forth, because I only care about the direction. And the, and if I do it long enough, I see that these vectors, even though they could have very well been you know, completely different directions, they actually end up pointing towards the same direction or, or parallel. So they lose this, uh, any information that was contained in their angle is completely lost, and everything that remains is just depends on their magnitude. And the idea of what we have, or the crap, is that uh, this actually carries over to deep uh, feed-forward networks. So you, we see the 
some, some, some similarities in, the, in what happens in the power iteration into deep neural net. And the depth corresponds to the number of these uh, multiplications. OK, so let me just quickly go through this. So consider this feedback network, one layer multi-level perceptron, if you will, inputs and n neurons, right? I can put all of this in a vector. So I will have the output will be an n-dimensional vector. I put x, I get one vector. I put y, I get another vector. I can easily just look at their dot product. Like I can look at the dot product of these outputs. And I can look at, at this dot product beyond just being a, a scalar. It also encodes in it the angle of the output, or the angle of the input as it goes through the transformation governed by the, by the network. Well, you know, things are much easier if we go asymptotic, so yes? What is the activation? Yes. So suppose, you know, you, you send n to infinity and you converge to, you have a lot of large number and so on, everything is nice, and you end up getting a, uh, something that you can think of it as an inner product in a feature space. Now, I'm a little bit vague here. What does that even mean? Or, but you, know, you still get an inner product in some kind of a Hilbert space. You can think of it, if you will. It's not really relevant to what I'm going to say as a, you know, some kind of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, got a unique kernel, and so on and so forth. But that's not the focus of my talk, even though that could be something that one can, can leverage upon and maybe say something more. But my whole talk relies on the fact that if I, for example, look at the feature transformations as being something like this, so I put an x into the network and I end up getting a function on some kind of a, um, some kind of a Hilbert space. Now I can think of phi as a mapping that sends every image in my network into a function. So the, the, the neural net itself can be, can be thought of as a member of a Hilbert space. Now I can think of because I have a, you know, Hilbert space, I can work with, it's got a lot of structure, I can work with, you know, different notions that comes with it, such as angles. And that's what we're going to do. This idea is not ours by any means. This viewpoint, a few years ago, is brilliant people came up with it, and they showed that if your weights are Gaussian, and your sigmas, or activation functions, are ReLU, you get what's known as the R cosine kernel, it can be written like this, that sends the angle at the output as measured by the kernel to this, uh, relates to the angle in the input and this angle is just a good old, good old uh, Euclidean uh, angle. So the first thing we did in this paper was that to replace Gaussian with all the rotationally invariant distributions. And we showed that the kernel stays the same. Now what is an example of rotational invariant? Beyond Gaussian you can think of multivariate T distribution, multivariate Laplace, and, and so on and so forth. So it will be augmented class. You can also think of the, uh, that kernel is a little bit in more compact way as the, expect, or the, the, the cross variance of, uh, of these two transformations of a random uh, variable which is Gaussian whose covariance is given like this. The details of this really doesn't matter. The point of that is that you can extend these results to more general weight, weights. They don't have to be rotationally invariant. And, but, but you lose this uh, equality. So now the universal kernel was exactly R cosine. But in this case, in more general weights, you get convergence in distribution where for any activation function, as long as they're well behaved in that sense, and you have a weight distribution that's also got some finite moments and mean zero, as the m or the number of inputs go, uh, go to infinity, you actually end up approaching the universal kernel. This is a little bit weak. We can also get convergence in expectation for not every activation function for these three classes that are actually more relevant these days anyways. And under similar assumptions, we can get the, that the, the actual kernel will converge into the uh, the arc quotient kernel as the m goes to infinity. Excuse me, so that yeah. says that, that as m goes to infinity, information is being lost? Right. Well, it's not, I don't know if, no, no, okay, so I, this, this is, doesn't say that in per se, it just says that uh, as m goes to infinity, the, uh, you can always assign a kernel to this uh, network, it just says that kernel approaches the arc quotient kernel. Yeah, because the cosine means that the, that the two vectors are on top of each other. I'll so. get to it right now, okay. yeah. Okay, so, but now let's look at the, uh, the, the crap problem. Okay, so this is the leaky ReLU, if you will, is a generalization of ReLU, and uh, I just plug in the, the thing that we got for the leaky ReLU, um, the, um, 
the generalized universal or cosine kernel for that. That relates angle at the input to the angle at the first layer, but there's no reason why you have to stop at the first layer. You can keep on going. So, and by the way, also look at the normalized kernel because I want to get rid of the, the magnitudes. I just want to look at angles. And uh, I can recursively apply this sort of a kernel, and I get that at every layer, I can relate the angle at that layer as measured by Euclidean space, a Euclidean norm to the, to the next one. And if I do this repeatedly, this is the, uh, the result that was interesting to me because what it says <coughs> is that, uh, for example, in a leaky ReLU, or ReLU is a special case of it, actually this angle between the inputs converges to zero as measured by this, by, this, uh, by this kernel. What does that mean? That means that regardless of how I want to train, again, at initialization, regardless of how I, what kind of image I put at the beginning into my neural net, pretty much everything is lost. Neural net completely becomes oblivious to the, uh, all the information contained to the input image. The only thing that now at that moment sees is just a magnitude which is uh, much smaller than when you can think of angles and so on. And, and even though a lot of these, you know, could be just, hey, you say you have to send n inf to infinity, you know, have infinite number of neurons, but the central limit theorem kicks in pretty quickly and you can, just for a few hundred neurons, you can see that they actually follow the theoretical curve pretty, uh, pretty nicely. So what this curve is saying is that uh, the blue, and as we get darker towards the red, the number of layers are increasing. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 128. And this new is the degree of freedom of the multivariate T distribution. So it's one example that we have. We have other examples as well. And as you can see, the angle between the input and output follows, first of all, the theoretical result. But also, as the number of layers increase, you can see that everybody is getting shifted up and is approaching the angle zero. Yes? Fred, so is this, again, without uh, training? So without training. I'll get to training. So is, it, is this not intuitive? Because if you have more layers and you know, all of them are randomly initialized, yeah. then basically by the end, Sure. Right? sure, this is like the, uh, essentially like the power iteration but, that but you can think of. Increase the number of layers because they think uh, that the, the network will be more predictable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let me get to it. So this does not say that increasing layer is bad. It just says that in, one thing that definitively says is that increasing layer and a random initialization makes it a lot harder to train oh. than, than just you know, some careful initialization, for example. This is only at the, but we have extended this, actually, R Russell has extended this. Let, let me just finish this. So, so the, the idea is that, you know, it maps all the inputs to similar points. Remember, it's, it's, a, it's a Hilbert space, so angles matter. It sort of point, maps them to similar points as it, relates to, as it relates to angles. Again, that means all information is lost. So this is the key result, or I have to say, that comes as a result of this, is that it's hard to train if you randomly initialize, at least initially, with the, with the depth. Okay, so what does that even mean to the, uh, another implication of this is that the initialization, that you can go through similar arguments, blah, 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 and come up with the result that, you know, uh, if I in initialize my weights at least with the weights that have variance like that, I preserve certain properties, and the interesting thing about this is that it actually collapses to the case of the, this popular uh, uh, initialization that people use for the case of ReLU, it collapses to what we have for the case of um, um, leaky ReLU if you put A equals zero. So it's a generalization of that. I'm not gonna go through this. Let me just, because I'm running out of time, it's just now let me talk about the, the training, right? So not that, this was just initialization, but training. As you can imagine, training becomes extremely difficult to answer any question because you take one iteration of any optimization algorithm, you immediately lose everything you had assumed about your weights. If you assume IED, you lose that. If you assume Gaussian, you lose that. You lose every assumption that you have. Now, Russell has shown that, in fact, it not all is lost. There is still some structure that's maintained, even if you start training, as long as your optimization algorithm satisfies a certain property. So I'm not <coughs> going to get into the exact details of the result, but it will be hopefully out next week or the week after that. Um, like other things on my... Sure. Yeah, yeah. So what does it say? It says for certain class of optimization procedures, such as SGD, which is very popular, they maintain a certain invariance, meaning that the layer-wise kernel actually remains our cosine, 
As a result, the kernel of the full network also remains constant across the iteration, so they're invariant, they stay on the invariant, if you will, path as measured by this arc quotient kernel. Whereas if you look at Adam or RMS prop, they have this tuning parameter epsilon that you divide by, and it shows, it shows that as the epsilon changes, there's actually a very sharp transition from where the, the kernel can be very well approximated by R cosine to the point that the kernel is no longer near uh, being R cosine, and in fact, they destroy the whole symmetry as measured by the R cosine. So, and that, you could, you could argue that has to do with sometimes Adam having a better performance than SGD. We don't know that. These are very uh, preliminary results. And another thing that's interesting is that the relation between these and what Michael is gonna talk about, as well as the results of uh, Peter Bartlett that says, you know, you can measure the complexity of the network as it relates to the, to the covariance, to, to the norm of the weights, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'll, with that, I'll stop, and I'm not gonna talk about graphs, apologize, but, uh, yeah. Thanks, both Harry and Fred. How about one quick question? So, okay. I ask the question, so you ask oh, well. uh, I'm not Very sure that quick. I could get the message of this work well. So you are saying that no matter what the input is, if the layer just increases yeah. at the end of the deep learning, the direction doesn't matter. They, the, what matters is the amplitude, right? Yeah, so the, the, the angles or the direction as measured by this, uh, by the action of neural net on it. I mean, you obviously can look at it in a, in a Euclidean, Counterintuitive because in computer vision that because you can think about deep learning as a representation at the end of the day. So right. this goes back to the question that Ilsa asked earlier. I'm not saying that deep learning is a bad thing. I'm just saying if you have a deep learning and you randomly initialize it, at the initial phase you're gonna have issue because there's there is no expressivity, if you like, left in the network because it just jumbles everything up and it doesn't care about inputs anymore. So it might take you a long time before you can break this symmetry to get to some point, and SGD might take a lot longer time because it's invariant to these, it stays invariant to this kernel, whereas Adam breaks this much quicker and you can actually train with Adam faster than SGD. So this is the message. I'm not saying deep learning is bad. The crap only applies to the initialization. We can talk later. Um, thanks, Fred. I think we've that. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs>